Father, we do thank you once again for the opportunity, Lord, to come to you. And God, I pray that tonight as we look at your word, as we, as we wrap up this book, that Lord, it would, would impact our hearts. Just as Paul, I, I love the end of letters as Paul's pouring out his heart to the people he's writing to, the church there in Ephesus, how he's concerned about them. And, and Lord, I know that that's your heart for all of us, every generation, every church. And so let us read this as though it's written to us. And let it be a strengthening for us, even, even if we're going through hard times, tough times, good times, Lord, let it penetrate deep within our beings. And we thank you for this opportunity in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, tonight we're going to wrap all of the, the armor up in the one thing, and I believe the most important thing. Paul ends all of this with prayer. Prayer is not one of the, it's not part of the armor. It's the essential for the armor. And, you know, it's interesting, today's the day of prayer. How cool that God just like lined this up. And some people go, how did you figure that out? Oh, I so didn't figure that out. That, uh, but it's kind of cool. Bummer. I don't know if I should say this. I got to say this. Our president did a proclamation on the day of prayer with never mentioning God. Sad. Every president prior to this has at least brought God into the proclamation. Never even, anyway, so, sorry. Shouldn't do that, but I had to. Prayer. When we think of prayer, how important prayer is in our lives. And I think, I don't know, we all get into place where sometimes we start taking it for granted. I remember hearing an interview with Billy Graham and he said if the one thing he could change in his life that he would pray more. And you know, you, you gotta know that uh, you think all of us at the end of our lives and it's something so essential, and it's easy to talk about, do seminars for, do conferences on, and all of that, but it's the hardest thing to do. And I'm not talking about just the act of prayer, I'm talking about stopping and praying. The actual act of prayer shouldn't be hard, it's just fellowshipping with God, right? It's just talking to him. And I know sometimes as newer believers, it's a little bit freaky, right? As a new believer, you're thinking that you have to speak just right. My favorite prayer in the Bible is Peter, when he's sinking, and he says, Lord, help. That's a great prayer. You know, I just love that prayer. And, and so I, I think we gotta be careful that we don't make it so formal that people think that they can't do it. They think, man, I can't talk like that or I couldn't put it that way. God just wants to hear your heart. And he just, you know, that fellowship. So bottom line, that's all prayer is. Now, you know, it's interesting, and, and I wrote this down. It's, it's, uh, there's several books that are really good to w read about the warfare, and all of them kind of wrap this last part up in prayer. Warren Wearsby wrote a book, What to Wear uh, to the War. That's kind of a cool, cool title, cool book. Martin Lloyd-Jones, Martin Lloyd-Jones did a commentary on Ephesians. Well, I shouldn't say that. His commentary's, I think it's eight volumes. It's like some people are like, dude, do you? He doesn't, Martin Lloyd-Jones did not teach verse by verse. He taught word by word. You know, it's like, <laughs> golly, how do you get eight volumes? He, on this section that we've been looking at, it's an entire volume. So, and it's called, that last volume in his thing is called The Christian Soldier. And then I've told you about William Gurnall, who on this section wrote a book that's 1,200 pages, and it's called, you know, The Christian in Complete Armor. So there's a lot of that, but every single one of them spend a good amount of time in this last part, because this is where it comes together. This is where our strength, listen, this is that makes everything work. You can, you can get up and go through the motion of putting that armor on and not spend that quality time with God in prayer, and you're just like not doing anything. You're just going through the motions. And so we need to understand that. So Paul, listen, Paul writes all of that, and then I love, listen, and it's all one sentence for us, but, but we broke it up. Verse 18 starts with praying always. Now, I think that's, before we go on, just think about that. Paul's heart, and I think that's how Paul lived. He says, praying always. When I read this part here, and I think of Paul, and, and you know, I think of the armor of God, 
And I think of Paul dressed in his armor. I think his belt, right? His belt would have cracks in it. It'd have sweat on it. It had those sweat stains. It'd be used when you think of his shield or his breastplate. Probably got a bunch of dents in it and things going on. Probably half fallen off. His shoes are worn out. You kind of get in a point, right? His shield. Can you imagine what his shield looked like? His helmet. Whoo. It was probably really messed up, right? And his sword, handy. And you kind of think, and then here's what he says. Pray always. I think that's a good thing. Now, a lot of us think that when you pray, you have to fold your hands and close your eyes and, and bow your head. No, you can pray all the time, right? You can talk to God all the time. I have some pretty great times of prayer in the shower. I don't know why that's good for me, because I can't sing, so I don't sing in the shower. So I pray in the shower. And, you know, there's some good times of prayer, but you can talk to God anytime, anywhere, and have fellowship with him. Our God's not bound to these walls. I think most of us know that. But he's not so, not also, have you ever noticed in the Bible, some people kneel when they pray, some people stand up when they pray, some people sit down when they pray. So there's all, listen, it's not a position, it's not a physical position, it's a heart position. And you can, you know, you can, you can pour your heart out to God anywhere, anytime. Doesn't matter in any position. But I love the idea. Are you kind of always praying? Are you, and here's the way I think about it. Are you kind of walking through life always connected to God? Just you have that closeness to him and you're just kind of walking with him. And then if he whispers something in your ear, you're able to hear him and do that. So listen, pray always. And then he says this, with all prayers and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. You're kind of getting the idea he's all in. Okay, he is this all over and over and over. So you know what I think we should be doing is we should be praying people, right? Once again, not just, you know, sometimes people say, well, you know, Calvary Chapel, you guys don't spend a lot of time in prayer in your services, which is true. We don't, we don't spend, a, a, you know, an exorbitant amount of time. But we have prayer meetings. It, it's always funny to me and odd to me why some people think everything should happen within this hour or so that we're gathered together and we should do everything. We should have a great time, a long time of worship. We should have a long time of prayer. We should have a long time of teaching. That's not gonna work. It's not practical to do that. So we have other times where we, we have the things. We have the women's prayer on Tuesday morning, the men's prayer on Wednesday morning and I know there's other groups that gather together and pray and that's a good thing. But I think it's more important that we're praying as individuals. And that we're busy praying, we're praying all the time, and that we're also praying all different sorts of prayer. Do you understand there's a lot of different things? I wrote some down uh, just for reference and, and uh, thinking about it. Yeah. Do you ever just stop and bless God for what he's done for you? Just that prayer of blessing and maybe blessing on others. Yeah, the prayer of thanksgiving, right? Just stop and thank him for everything that you can imagine. That's fun sometimes, just to, just to have that heart and not have the, oh, I hate this and I hate that. But God, thank you. Spending that time in confession, isn't it good to get all of your sin out and get it taken care of and have him take care of it and wash it away and it's done. You've confessed it to him. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And I love it. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I believe if you've spent some quality time with God in prayer, you know what? Man, you come away sparkling. It's better than going through Mr. Car Wash. Like you're just like. And you can do that anytime. You can do that anywhere. And we have that prayer of confession. I have the prayer of petition or prayer of supplication. Those are kind of the same thing, right? You ask God for things. And there's nothing wrong with that. I, I crack up when people go, well, you know, I never ask God for anything. And I go, that's why you don't have anything. <laughs> My Bible says you have not because you ask not, right? I ask God, I ask God for the weirdest stuff. I, I'm, sure, I'm sure when God sees me bowing my heart, he's going, oh. Like my mom, oh, Patrick, really? That's what you're bringing? Yeah, Lord, because here's my list, man, 
right? I think we should have a long list of thanksgiving, but there's nothing wrong with asking him for things. We can ask him for, you know, it's good to ask him for spiritual things, right? I wanna put that at the top of the list. I wanna be spiritual for you guys, you know? It's good to do that, but you can also ask him for physical things. You can ask him for situations and circumstances. It's okay to ask God for things. It cracks me up when we act like, well, I'm, uh, uh, and you're so pious. Can I touch you? You know, as when people do that. And, come on. And then, and then we have the prayer of intercession. Do you spend time interceding for others? Asking God to take care of others, maybe to heal others, to bless others? I believe that's one of the greatest tools and influences we have. You know, the whole thing now with social media is you have the influencers. We're familiar with that, right? With the, especially the YouTube influencers. Drives me nuts. <laughs> Are you an influencer in heaven? Are you bringing brothers and sisters before him? Are you, you know, pounding the gates of heaven? for those people that you're close to, those people that you're far from, maybe your enemies. One of the greatest things you can do is pray for people who have really ticked you off. And don't pray that God would take them out real soon. <laughs> pray that God would change your heart. But listen, man, we have all of those. So when he says this, listen, man, he says with all prayers and supplications, and we're gonna get to in the spirit in a minute, and watchful to this end. Listen, when we think about, when we think about doing this prayer and, and, you know, we put on the armor with prayer, right? Is it that, how are you gonna put on the armor if you don't stop and be quiet and put it on, right? That's prayer. And we use it, listen, we function with it in prayer. We think about that. So how the armor is tied to prayer is pretty significant, but I also want to emphasize it's not, a, it's not one of the pieces of the armor. Prayer is everything. And he tells us, listen, then, then the one part that I think gets some of us is it says praying uh, with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. And... There's a whole thing of what does it mean to pray in the spirit? And I know, listen, I know there's denominations, there's a, you know, charismatic movement that I think we're part of that because we believe the gifts are for today. And I believe, listen, I believe there are times where you can pray in tongues. Some people have that gift, some people don't. And it's okay, listen, it's not you're up here if you have the gift and you're kind of here if you don't. It's just different, right? We're all different. But I don't believe praying in the spirit here is about praying in tongues. I think it's praying according to the will of God and hearing the heart of God and listening to God and praying in the spirit that way. Not, listen, because if you put it in the other camp, then you're gonna say there's some people who never do it. It's praying, listen, it's being so close to God, you're praying God's heart for that situation. That's praying in the spirit and you're praying according to his will. And that's what, listen, that's gonna say, that's what Tom, I think his name's Paul. That's what Paul is talking about. Yeah, the, my, my head is like, so listen, man, Paul is, Paul is like, come on, guys. Think about what's going on. Now get a picture again. Where's Paul at? It's in prison. And here he's telling this church, you guys gotta be a praying church. It's kind of interesting when he starts a letter. Do you, do you remember when we started this? Like, I don't know when it was. I never keep track of that. Uh, just a little while ago. <laughs> Do you remember when we started this? We start in heaven. Remember Paul saying you're blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. And, and man, we start in heaven. Isn't this great? Listen, you start in heaven and you end up on your knees, so to speak. Again, not talking about physically we have to be there. But here he's saying, man, we do that. We pray in the spirit. And then, and then watchful to this end, with all perseverance. We talked about supplication for all the saints, but listen, man, being watchful. Have you ever paid attention to when Jesus would tell the disciples to pray? What was he also telling them? Be watchful. And what were they not? Watchful, right? And hey, we need to be people who are alert to what's going on and what's happening and what's happening right now things that are going on, are you watchful to that end? And are you alert? Are you paying attention? Do you see what's happening in our world? 
And do you understand what's happening in our world? And what does he tell us? Listen, here's the important thing, is he's telling us this battle's not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And we need to understand that. So men, we need to be people who are alert to what's going on and listen. And then we have that perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Now here's a, here's a crazy thing. Here's a bad illustration. If you've been doing the Bible reading, we were just in Joshua, right? Good, some people said yes. I wouldn't trick you, probably. But in Joshua, the two times... It, and if you haven't read Joshua for a while, go back and read these. Joshua chapter seven, Joshua blows it and he doesn't pray and he goes into Ai and he doesn't spend time in prayer. And what happens, man? There's a mess going on, why? Because somebody, Achan stole the bacon a little while earlier and they're in some serious trouble about that and he never stopped to ask God about what was going on. And then in Joshua chapter nine, same thing. It says they went out without the counsel of the Lord and they got, cremated, they got creamed by the, I was gonna say cremated, but they got creamed by the, by the enemy, not cremated. But listen, man, think about that. And think about that in your own life. Listen, I believe, here's the thing, Joshua's failure didn't just cost Joshua, it cost an entire nation. Our failure sometimes to pray might cost someone around us something. So it's important we understand that and that we're that people. And you know, hey, I'm not up here telling you I am the best prayer warrior. If you want a prayer warrior, call me. I, I struggle. I have a hard time with a prayer life. It's difficult to stop and discipline myself. And I think it's more for people who kind of have a, you know, the excuse is ADD. I'm, I'm not sure that's real. But I bounce around so much, and when I pray, listen, when I pray, my mind starts going every which way. And I'm like over here and over there, and I'm thinking about this, and you know, I wonder what time my tea time is for golf, and what time is this, and you know, hey, I'm just being real with you guys. And it's hard, it's a battle, why? Because it's so important for a spiritual life. He says, hey, you got to be doing that. Now check this out, this is the part that really blows my mind, and he says, pray, with supplication for all the saints and for me that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Oh, oh man, listen. Listen, Paul now is saying, hey, I want you to pray for me. If you were in prison, what would you ask people to pray for? Uh, we got some honest people here. Get me out of here, right? That's what I would pray for. What does Paul pray for? Let me be a good witness. It's like, oh man, Paul, why do you do that stuff? Like, you know, you're just thinking, man, what is the matter with this guy? He's like super saint, right? He says, hey, pray that I would have utterance. And he wasn't in a modern day, like, cushy jail that we kind of have now. He was like chained and probably in a dungeon, probably kicked around. Don't you know the Roman soldiers treated him horribly? I mean, I just, we, we talked about his armor from God, but think about his body and all the bruises and, hey, go back and read Corinthians where he talks about all the things that happened to him. He's gotta be hurting physically and it's gotta hurt emotionally to be put in that situation. And here's what he says, pray for me, pray that I would have utterance. Pray that I could speak to these guys. That's strong, isn't it? Now, I do believe, listen, I do believe our Christian leaders need prayer. I believe our physical leaders. I believe we should be praying for, you know, our, our mayor and, and our, 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 what's he called, the governor. It just slipped my mind. And, uh, you know, the president. I think we should be praying for those offices and those people in those offices and that God would move in their lives. I, I believe that's a responsibility. But how often, you know, again, are we praying for our Christian leaders around us? You know, it's kind of weird, but, but how often do you pray for your pastor? Do you hold them up in prayer? And, you know, and I think some of you are, are tremendous about that. But, how, you know, do we do that? Are we faithful to God? You know, every time I read where some pastor fails morally, I, I always think this. I wonder if the church was praying for him. I wonder if they were covering him up and, or if they were, you know what, if they were a little bit negligent and then he started slipping. Do you remember in Exodus, I think it's Exodus chapter 17, 
Do you remember when Joshua went to war? And this is, this is kind of using this in, in, in an example of this. Remember Moses went up on the hill and he prayed? And you remember what happened when his hands were up? There was victory. When his hands went down, they started losing. That tells us the power of prayer, but you, here's the cool part. Do you, remember, do you remember what happens? The two brothers come alongside, Aaron and, and lift up his hands and hold him up. That's what we should be doing. We should be doing that with one another, but I think especially our, our leaders and our churches, we should be holding them up. And, and listen, man, and we should be asking, give them good utterance. Let them say the right things in the right places and not the wrong things and not the, the, the evil things, but let them say the right things. So listen, as we do that, and then, and then he's not quite done. He says, listen, he says that I, I may make known the mystery of the gospel. Remember, Paul calls the gospel a mystery. Why? Because it's not in the Old Testament. Do you know that the church is not in the Old Testament? It's a mystery, why? Because it's this thing that God was doing that was not revealed until Jesus Christ came and died on the cross. And again, mystery biblically is talking about something that God reveals, not something you find out with a decoder ring and special you know, glasses and stuff. You find out when God opens it up and reveals it. But he says that I, make, that I might make known the gospel for which, verse 20, for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Seriously, Paul? Do you hear what he calls himself? He doesn't call himself, listen carefully. He doesn't look at himself as a prisoner. He looks at himself as an ambassador. I'm thinking, man, I want to live life like that. I want to have that kind of attitude. I, I got to tell, I got to be really honest. When things, bad things happen to me, I'm a whiner. I'm like, why did that happen to me? That's not fair. That's not fun. I don't like people doing that. I don't like doing that. I have a great wife. She like holds me up and says, stop it. Why are you whining? And what does Paul say? Paul says, hey, I'm an ambassador. I got this new position. I'm an ambassador to Rome for Jesus Christ. And you're in jail, dude. Don't you kind of want to like shake him? Dude, you're in jail. You're not an ambassador. Nope, I'm an ambassador. Think about that in your life. Think about that the next time you're in a sticky situation. And I'm not talking about, listen, I'm not talking about if you've done something and you know, like you, you did something dumb and you're getting chastised and chastened for that. I'm talking about the next time your circumstances seem unfair. I want you to think about, hey, I'm an ambassador right now because God put me in this position so I could do something to bring him glory and to, you know, to lift his name up. And then listen again, that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Now, I think if there's anybody who shared the gospel boldly, I think it would be Paul. But from this, I kind of read like, well, I could do so much more. And isn't that how we all should feel? Like, I haven't done quite enough. I could do more, and I could be better at this. So that's Paul. Listen, that's Paul kind of laying out this whole idea of prayer. Now, as he closes this letter up, man, you got to love. This is, to me, one of the funnest endings of a letter. Like, I, I like the end. I know a lot of us, we get to the end of a letter, and we just go, yeah, you just sign it off, blah, 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 and we go on to the next part. Listen to what he says. Listen carefully. And again, kind of keep this in context of prayer. Verse 21, but that you also may know my, but that you also may know my afflictions and how I am doing. Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make all things known to you. Now, this is kind of crazy. Listen, do you hear what Paul is saying? He's concerned that they're concerned about him. That's nuts. I don't want you guys, listen, here's what he's saying. I don't want you guys all freaking out and all upset, so I'm gonna send, and it's kind of a hard name, right, Tychicus. I'm gonna send, you know, this guy to you, and he's gonna explain everything to you. He's gonna let you know how everything's going. Number one, this guy like pops up in the weirdest times. A challenge as you read your New Testament. This is Tychicus, he pops up at weird times. We know he's from Ephesus, 
If you read when Paul was in Ephesus, he shows up at the big riot that's going on. So he's kind of there and, and probably a convert of Paul's. And it seems like he might have even joined Paul and gone through some of the junk that Paul went through with Paul and with Luke. But listen, Luke doesn't record. There's not one thing recorded about him sharing, preaching, doing stuff, except for this. Listen to this. I'm sending my beloved Tychicus to you so that you will know I'm okay. Once again, you're suffering in prison. None of us like to be alone, do we? I I mean, I know some people are kind of loners, but nobody likes to be alone alone, especially when you're in prison. You gonna send maybe the one guy standing by you? Hey, why don't you go ahead and go back and let him know I'm okay? Now, he was from Ephesus, so I kind of get that. You go back and let the people there know. But isn't it, on the other hand, isn't it always good to hear from somebody I love, I get, I get emails from our missionaries and I love reading them, what's going on, what's happening in their lives and, and uh, you know, the, how God is moving in certain ways. And so, you know, that's all this is. And he says, listen, man, I'm sending my beloved brother and faithful minister of the Lord to make all things known to you. And then he says in verse 22, whom I have sent to you for this very purpose that you may know our affairs and that he may comfort your hearts. Wow. Wow. Once again, I would be writing and saying, I want him to let you know that you need to be comforting my heart because I'm bummed at where I'm at. He says, I want your hearts to be comforted. They were concerned. Paul was concerned about them. And again, kind of get that picture of where he's at. So, Imagine somebody you're bonded with, because I think this is important. Somebody you're bonded with, maybe not even just, you know, in in a family sense, but a brother or sister in the Lord that you've become very close with, and you're kind of hanging out with them. And at the time you need them the most, you send them away to take care of somebody else. That's Paul. That's what Paul does. And that's an example for us to think about. And he's so concerned about those, that church in Ephesus that they're gonna be okay, that they're gonna be all right, they're gonna do the right thing, that he sends Tychicus to them. Now, as he gets done with that, want a little bit more, listen to what he says. Verse 23, peace to the brethren. You know, I would challenge you to do something. Read the letters of Paul. You don't have to do it all tonight. Read the letters of Paul and find out how many times at the end of his letter, at his sign off, that he says peace to the brethren. Check it out, I would tell you, but I don't wanna spoil it because you know you're on a treasure hunt. But it's fascinating here, listen, we can only have peace with one another when we have peace with God. And we can only have peace with God through the blood of Jesus Christ and through what he's done for us. And once we, listen, once we own that and understand that and you have a peace with God, it's kind of easy to have peace with people, even people who like, like rub you the wrong way. Man, you can have a peace, why? Because you have a peace with God and you're in that place and you're walking and if you're, especially if you're walking in the spirit and especially if you're praying always in the spirit, man, you can like, somebody can come up and run over you with a truck and you go, hey, I'm sorry I was in your way, I didn't mean to be there and you know, listen what he's saying, man, peace. I want that kind of peace. When I walk through, I want to have, be that person. And you know, I got to be really honest, man. This is, this is an area I struggle in. I'm, I'm a fighter. I'm an arguer. I'm a like, I'm going to get in your face. And I, I don't know that I'm violent, but I think it's part of my genetic makeup. I'll blame that. That there's nothing like a good argument. And Paul's saying, no, you gotta live at peace. No. I remember when I first got saved, man, I would read those parts in the Bible, and especially when Jesus in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the peacemakers. No. How come it's not blessed are the arguers? You know, and it was just so hard for me. And then, and then especially in James when he talks about being a peacemaker and how God, no. Because I knew I wasn't measuring up, right? And here's, here's Paul doing this at the end of this letter. And think about everything we've learned in this letter, who we are in Christ, how, 
all the things he's done for us, that we're his workmanship and all the things we've learned and walking in that and what does it mean in our marriage? What does it mean in our family? What does it mean to our children? What does it mean in the workplace? And he gives us all of that and then he's saying, hey, peace to the brethren and love with faith. Now, I think we know what faith is. We've been studying it for like four and a half months in Hebrews, right, on Sunday morning. So if you don't know what faith is, you're brain dead. You haven't been coming to church, maybe that's it too. But listen, we, we kind of have an idea what faith is. But how about this? Listen, peace to the brethren and love with faith. Are you loving one another? We kind of know this, and, and we'll get back to this in a minute, but that's that agape love. That's that unconditional love. It's easy to love people who love you. It's easy. When people are nice to me, I'm, that's great. So when people are turkeys, when people are rubbing you the wrong way, when, how about when people are saying bad things about you? How about when people are spreading rumors about you? Gossip. Talking behind your back. You're only gonna have that peace when you have that love. And you have that love through faith in God. You see, once you come to that understanding, and I'm kind of getting ahead of the love of God in your heart, you can do that. So he says, listen, man, with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he's bringing that whole thing in there. And now imagine these people getting this letter. And they're struggling. They're having a hard time. And their founding pastor is in jail, he's in prison, probably gonna be executed. He wrote them this really great letter about, listen carefully, about this third race. Remember us talking about it? He had the Jews and the Gentiles. And he says, hey, you're Christians. And I believe there's only two races in the world. I don't believe there's a multitude of races. I believe there's two, believers and unbelievers. And you fall in one camp or the other. And whichever camp you're in, is how you're going to live. And he says, listen, man, he says, you, peace, and, and peace to the brethren, love with faith from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. He's pouring that out, and think again, as he's sitting there in prison, probably in a funky, funky dungeon, and all that's going on, and then, listen, then he says this, grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity or with a love that is incorruptible, some of yours may say. And then he says, amen. Listen, there's, there's a lot of controversy. This last part, here's this last part, man. Paul is pouring out his heart. He's dumping on these people, I think, loads of great stuff. And again, the experts, well, I don't know. What does it mean? What does it mean when he says, grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ? This says insincerity, but let's read what some other translations kind of put it in there. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love that's incorruptible. Here's what people say. Oh, Paul just put a, a condition on God's grace because you get God's grace if you love him with a love that's incorruptible. Now, I think you start picking it apart that way, you're in trouble. Here's what Paul's saying. You can only love God when you love him with a love that's incorruptible that he has given you. You can't just wake up one day and by osmosis start loving God. God's gotta put that in your heart. God's gotta give you that love. And when he gives you that love, check this out, it's incorruptible love. It can't be corrupted, it can't be diminished, it can't be messed up. I read it that way and I go, yes. Yes, and it gets me excited. It's not, listen, I don't look at it as a condition. I look at it as a fact. And I know in my life, when I really began to realize the love of God in my life, that's what changed my perspective towards other people, towards brothers and sisters, towards what's going on. Because I understand, listen, I, nothing bugs me more when unbelievers start saying, well, you know, Jesus is about love, and they have no idea what they're talking about. It's not like, you know, it's not like the love of the world, it's the love of God. And when the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, it changes us. Now let's think about this for a moment because here's an interesting thing. Through this letter, I don't know if you've been keeping track, through this letter, Paul has brought up love about 14 times. That's quite a bit in a letter that's only got six, I was gonna say six verses, six chapters. 
That's, you know, twice a chapter. That's quite a bit. And you've ever thought, and I, I challenge you again, go back and reread Ephesus and the letter that Paul wrote to Ephesus, and then when you're done with it, turn to Revelation chapter two, not right now, and read what Jesus says to the church at Ephesus. Wow. 14 times Paul tells them to love. When Jesus speaks to the church at Ephesus, what does he say? You guys have left your first love. Oh, does that like break your heart? Like, I think a lot of us, you know, and I, I think a lot of us think, well, you know, if I had a little bit better pastor, I would be a better person. I mean, I, I, I gotta be really honest. I mean, I think if Paul was our pastor, that would be awesome, right? Would it? He didn't make a big difference in Ephesus, did he? I mean, he influenced them and he's there, but by the time, listen, just, you know, 20 years later, maybe 30 years later, they're in horrible shape. And Jesus has to chastise them for the one thing that Paul emphasized 14 times and here at the very close when he says, listen, man, grace be to all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with incorruptible love. That's where you're at. And what happened? A generation, and they changed. Saints, we got a responsibility. We got a responsibility to pass on what we have. And this relationship that we have with our God, we should pass that on to those who are our, 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 our children, our grandchildren, some of us maybe have great grandchildren. We need to pass that legacy and we need to let them see God alive in us. Because I gotta tell you something, I read about Paul here and I'm thinking, man, if I had that guy around me, I could follow Jesus pretty easy because man, he is convincing, he's doing it, he's not just talking about it, et cetera, et cetera. Well, shouldn't we be doing that as believers? Shouldn't we be living out our faith to our children, to our grandchildren, to our neighbors, to those all around us. And that's what Paul's challenge is. So I gotta say something, man. It's to me sort of interesting. I mean, you know, at the, if finally at the end he does say amen. And it's like, Phew. thank you. Remember amen's not over and out, right? He's going, may it be so. Man, Paul's heart for the church in Ephesus is that they would walk strongly with God. Even at the end, quote, of his life, when he's in prison, hey, guys, hang in there. Hang in there. Not concerned about, he's not concerned about Paul. He's concerned about that church. You know what I found in my life? It's really hard to get down and out when you're concerned about other people. But when I focus on Pat, oh, I can get down and out. We can get depressed. And you know what else I found? When I'm hanging out with brothers and sisters, physically, not just, you know, again, not just on videos and not to put down. I understand some can't come and, and I get that. But man, we need this interaction. God created us to be social beings. And there is so much hurt going on in our world right now, emotional hurt in people's lives because of isolation. And we have the opportunity to be, as I shared on Sunday, the hope for those people. We can be the hope if we shine brightly and if we're concerned about others and let them know we're concerned about them and let them know that we're there for them. Then God gets the glory. So let's be Paul's. I don't think any of us are chained to anybody. I don't think any of us are like in some kind of dungeon. Some of you may feel chained, shame on you. If you're calling your marriage a chain, you need some counseling. Pastor Jack's available every Tuesday through Friday. But most of us, listen, we're not in a situation that he is, and yet, if we're really honest, we spend such little time concerned about other people. For really gut check on us. I know it's good in church to go, oh, yes, I pray, I have my prayer list, and I do this, and you should, Pat, you should see my prayer list. Well, whoopee dingo, but 
Are you using it? Are you praying for people? Are you spending that time? And not just, listen, it's not just one hour a day. It's all day, every day. You're in that attitude. I think it's important to set aside a time. I get that. But it bothers me when people go, you know, when people do lay that trip on us, well, if you're not praying at 5 a.m., God can't hear you. Seriously? Like you think he goes to bed at 6? Like what? (laughs) I mean, what's the deal? God can, listen, and so I understand, I, I think we should, in busy lives, if we don't set aside time, we usually don't pray. And you know, you can't throw up a quickie prayer unless you've been spending time in prayer. Because you just won't do it either, but you, you can't. So think about that, and think about where we're at. And when you think about a national day of prayer, it kinda, I have to be honest, it kinda bothers me. We should have an every day of prayer. Not just one day, well today, let's pray, and everybody acts all pious and says certain things, and you know, and I get it, I get what's going on. We used to do some great things in this city, and that kind of all fell by the wayside, and, and that's a good thing, but as believers, every day is a day of prayer. Not just one day a week, not just early in the morning, not just late at night, every day, every hour, let's be praying people and walking with our God. And woo, we're gonna see some great things happen in this world. Let's stand up and pray. Father, I thank you, Lord. I thank you for the challenge that Paul gives us. And, and Lord, how he just kind of like hits us where, where, quote, where it hurts. And I thank you for that. And I pray for myself. I pray for my brothers and sisters that we wouldn't just talk about it, we wouldn't just, even, even it wouldn't just be a public thing that we do. But Lord, it would be a lifestyle in our lives. We wouldn't want to just make sure everybody knows I'm a praying person, but God, we would be a praying person. And we would be people in fellowship with you. And Lord, if we're not, I pray, I pray right now, if we're not, that God, you would come and encourage us and strengthen us. I don't want anybody walking away from here tonight feeling like, like they don't count because they, they've messed that up and they haven't been doing that. But Lord, work in their hearts, in all of our hearts. And Lord, I know your heart is to draw us to you, not push us away from you. And so I pray you would do that tonight and you would be glorified. And God, as we come to your table, let this be so precious and so good as we fellowship with you around the bread and the cup. In Jesus' name, amen.